All right. Welcome. So hello, everyone, and welcome to our Facebook Live discussion. Today, we'll be talking about breaking barriers, Black mental health experience. So first, I just want to quickly open up with talking about a, a study. Uh, there was a study conducted by the Irving Medical Center of Columbia University. Uh, adults who identify as Black or African American are 20% more likely to experience a serious mental health problem. Although the odds are higher, less than a quarter, less than a quarter of these individuals seek mental health care due to ongoing issues such as systemic barriers to care, stigma, and finding culturally competent care. So for tonight, what I'd like to do first is introduce myself. My name is Ryan Gatero, and I will be your host and moderator uh, through the evenings, this evening's discussion. We are very excited to have such a great group of panelists. Uh, so they will be sharing their experience and clinical knowledge about mental health in the Black and African American community. So I'm going to start tonight by uh, choosing our first individuals here. Uh, Tanya, I'm going to start with you tonight. Please uh, welcome. Uh, please introduce yourself. My name is Tanya Porter, and I'm what they call a, sh a clinical shift administrator for um, uh, a treatment center that deals with uh, dual diagnosis, substance abuse, and mental health. And I've been in the field now probably about eight years, and I love what I do. But I also have a passion for what I do because, you know, um, I'm one of them. I'm also a person living in, um, I'm open about my recovery. I just celebrated nine years of uh, living um, uh, in recovery and just grateful to be able to give back what I've been so freely given. So I'm passionate about what I do because I am them. So thank you for having me and I'm honored. Wonderful. Thank you, Tanya, so much. All right, moving along, Justin. How's everybody doing? Um, my name is Justin Williams. I'm from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, I am a uh, program director for a program of statewide. It's called Life in PA. Uh, that the uh, which Life stands for uh, Living in Fulfilled Excellence. So we travel and we use STEM-based uh, programming uh, for uh, urban youth to be able to teach them through music, music business, music uh, entertainment, all the skills that go into uh, entertainment video and we teach them uh, through a steam based project based learning. So um, whenever anybody checks out our website, you'll see a lot of the programming that we do across the state. But I'm also uh, a paraeducator in the Harrisburg School District. So uh, I work directly with uh, high schoolers at this point. I've, I've worked from preschool to school, uh, high school age, but uh, this is something that I've, in my career over the 18 years I've been doing this, I've been, I've had to experience and deal with on, on different different levels. So it's it's great to be here to be able to speak with other people and their experiences and see uh, where this conversation leads. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, moving along, Stefan. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Stefan. Um, I'm a uh, licensed mental health counselor um, based out of Orlando, Florida. Um, uh, currently working um, in the outpatient facility out here with um, mainly um, substance use, uh, individuals str struggling with substance abuse uh, and some mental health. I uh, have experience working with children, teenagers, young adults um, since um, getting out of school, but so now my main focus is uh, individual with, individuals with substance abuse. So. Great, thanks for coming on. All right, and last but not least, Kishara. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kishara Rosser. I am a licensed master social worker based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Woo -woo. Um, I'm so happy to be here this evening. I am currently working as a therapist with a private practice. We climb counseling consulting while I, where I specialize in helping individuals overcome mood disorders, trauma, um, any career issues that they may have, just a variety of different things. I also have a nonprofit, Power for Outreach, where we serve the youth, we have a mentoring program and we aim to prevent teenage pregnancy and all of the mental health issues that surround that. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kashara. So tonight, uh, I would like to, to focus a bit on and getting a better understanding of the current mental health crisis and how it's affecting this specific community. Um, also, just for everyone who at home, um, please, by all means, we want you to engage tonight. So feel free to type any questions you may have in the chat and we will uh, try our best to answer those, all right? So the first thing I wanna talk about tonight um, is really you know, just a general idea here. And it's having a better understanding of, of how you can identify, how can an individual identify that they are struggling uh, mentally? Um, so again, please, uh, anyone on the panel, feel free to jump in, all right? So how do, how do individuals struggle? Uh, how do they identify they're struggling? So I would say that an individual can first identify that they are struggling when they begin to notice that they are isolating themselves from people that they are normally around. They are no longer doing things that they are, have been interested in doing. And they may be sad when, you know, nothing may be going on. They may be overly anxious. There are a variety of different things that you can try to identify to see that you may be struggling mentally. Um, they may have just overcome a life change. You know, right now we're in a time of COVID where a lot of people are anxious about being around others. And, you know, we are human. So we are made to be around other people and have other social interaction. And it's really having a, a really tough mental impact on a lot of individuals. So you may identify as struggling just with that in general. Great. Thank you so much for that. Other thoughts? Yeah. And yeah, with what I see in children, what adults have to recognize, like, you know, everybody kind of has to be aware, you know, because kids go through these things a lot mm -hmm. earlier and the signs, you have to understand the signs like anxiety and anxiousness or not feeling safe, you know, about certain things are, are signs that either their, their perception of, of a certain place is is not right you know it needs to be you know they need to be transition work on transitioning maybe they have hard transitions I, I reach a lot of kids who have a hard two hours before they come see me and then i have to deal with you know what i mean those mm -hmm. things so a lot of things are out of your sight that i see too that so you just have to be a you know aware of even body language and things like that are that a person not wanting to make eye contact, not wanting to, you know, those are certain things that people are trying to create shields and spaces and places where they should feel free to be open and, and speak. So those are those are things I look for in my students are just that what are your natural, you know, reactions to what typical teenagers do or, or don't do? Or how do you respond to a good morning? You know what I mean? And those are different things. I'm really looking for the reaction, not you know, necessary, a particular sign of them coming to me crying about a particular issue. So it, it's just overall awareness is, it, it's more than just someone crying or coming out and saying something. It's, it's a lot of nuance to it. So I would say you have to, of course, know yourself, know how you would feel in a situation and be able to realize that most people don't feel that way. So start examining why, the why, in those situations. And I just I just like to add real quick. It's also too when you think of um mental health, behaviors change. Um now they're angry where they once had peace. Um they're crying crying spells, acting out in school or even home or at work. There's a lot of different patterns that the person's just not acting their normal, everyday, happy-go-lucky selves. It's a, a, a complete change. And it happens sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. But um, just watching, and especially if you know a person, a loved one, especially also an older Amer um, African and, and Black Americans too, all of a sudden there's, because all the different lives of changes, like we talk about COVID and we talk about, but we also have to talk about the stigma and pressure and all that stuff, carrying for a long time and there's a break, you know, and we don't always, youth, yeah, we're always paying attention, but the people around us, we think, especially African-American women, Black women, we think mm -hmm. that they're strong. 
and we don't and and then all of a sudden they have a break because we always seem to put up this facade that way the strong 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 and after a while the anger the yelling the screaming also health issues now the blood pressure is going up so it's so many different signs where mental illness that not just take care take effect on you mentally but physically physical signs show it as well so i want to put that out there because it's a, a whole rounded a different type of things that happen uh, over time or quickly yeah I feel a lot of people too. Uh, what, what we all have, and I, I, we've talked about in other places, that we all have a, a entitlement to what we feel like things should be, you know, and the way things should be. And when when they don't work out to that way, when you work harder, you put your and it, in life turns. It's dip. So for African Americans, we're always almost primed from birth to be ready for the shift. Like be ready. Be ready to take the shift. And when time goes by, you feel like, why should I have to make the shift when others don't or when this doesn't? And then there's a breaking point. And we never notice the buildup. We never, you know, we never really notice the buildup. We notice the, the overflow. And but I all speaking to youth, adults, most people they feel like, why me or why they feel like that their scenario should play out the way that they perceive it and that's mo that's all of us i feel like so a lot of those breaking points for african americans we start getting desensitized and conditioned a lot sooner to feel like hey they're not going to let allow you they're not and when you feel like i'm entitled to be there or be here and then you then you finally work hard to get there and you experience the black experience that we i'm pretty sure we've all experienced at some degree it, it it's a breaking point it's like what was all that what was this what was the and a reality comes to terms it's, and everyone's different when that when that comes to their mental state great, no, just, great. just to feed off of uh, justin really really fast like um kind of one I, that adds like another identifying factor and and uh tanya and justin are both touching on it and at least from what i've seen in my experience um how how unmanageable and unbearable is your circumstance and um and i think that's what justin is alluding to also you know there's not necessarily much there's not there's no talk you know no one's talking about it until it gets to that point and just with the, a lot of um, patients that i work with that's when they're coming in you know it's it's become so unbearable and so unmanageable that now they're looking out for help so sometimes um that can be a, an identifying factor as well you know um going through the motions uh pulling away from people crying acting out and then still not reaching out for help and then finally when it becomes so unbearable then i'm finally reaching out for help great and you know you i, I heard a whole lot there from each person i think it's important to take a look at something else right which is this uh with covid and i think a lot of people have had this emergence of of mental health related issues as a result of the isolation and the the, the idea of anxiety and depression um i think is is an important thing to to look at and i'm asking this question from a different context today which is this i think people have a very generic view of what anxiety and depression is and i guess my question really is 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 that do we feel like the the definition of, of anxiety and depression applies differently within the black community? How does it look there in that community versus the generic idea of anxiety and depression? Is it different or is it the same? A big problem that happens is that we, as black Americans, get grouped and everything, like even everything is a pocket fix when everyone's situation is not the same. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and everyone, but everyone is still experiencing the same reality. Is that it's, it's this weird space that that we're always put in that we have to deal with this as a group, and it's not an individual thing. Like, you're because you're a tough black woman. This one black woman should be the same level of toughness, mm -hmm. and if she's not she's not as strong or you know it's now a comparison to a great that we even using martin luther king for a bit i love experiencing my my black heroes as human my my mentor is malcolm x and i it, because he went through periods of change you know what i mean where he was not originally anywhere remotely to how he ended but when you look into the process he went through there it's it's one that 
we can take parts from, but he's an individual. His situation that he went to was very special. And I can only look at it in the degree as if how strong I can be <laughs> if, I, if he was able to go through that. And that's how we look at our icons and other blacks and how they, well, if they can do it, then we can do it and because we have to do it together. You know, it's it's never an isolated situation or incident. It's his blackness is my blackness. You know what I mean? And, it, and that's, that's a degree that coming from a city where I'm from, like that's not universal to everywhere where everybody else lives. Like, so it's, it's, we have to get off of that. All of our circumstances are the same and we would react mm -hmm. the same to those circumstances. But I also think we have to identify, like we have to understand that 13% of the US population or nearly 46 million um, um, African or black, Amer black Americans identify themselves as black. And then 2.7% of the population um, identifies biracial. Then mm -hmm. we also have to worry, we also have that demographic within that, that percentage I just said, we have Caribbean, we have African Americans who's coming from Africa, Nigeria. We who are born here are considered black American. So we have a lot of cultures and layers. So you can't lump us because right. with somebody who is Trinidadian or Haitian, all the, the culture also deviates and, and determines how they see anxiety, how they see mental health. You know, because we even with that strong barrier is levels of that word term strong, whether it's a black man or a black woman depends on where you come from. And if you're from the south, from the south, different from how we deal with Philly, New Jersey and up north, Midwest, um, the West Coast. So there's different degrees of how we look at. So in a way, it's still a black thing culturally, but it's mm -hmm. also where you born in America or where you come from. So in, there, it's in still culture, an individual thing. Culture, culture plays shifts. a big part. Right, culture Definitely. shifts. And mm -hmm. I, I experience African students who have a different mentality, but I know it comes from a, a immigrant mentality, not just a black, you know, a black, it's it's an immigrant. America is supposed to be the place where they settle to there. And because they're black, now they're grouped, you know, and now they're just they they are bringing something of their own in their mentality. Where here in America, we have to explain to a lot of my African students our entitlement. There is a, an entitlement. There are things that we are still waiting in line for, and we're 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 still trying to establish where you feel from a far distance we should have already had done. We should have been through that line already. So your perception also creates barriers of where. We have to educate each other about how we, you know, what we're experiencing from those from those places and spaces. Because I understand that it was different there, but when you come here, you have an expectation that you should not be living that way anymore. So imagine now how we feel of someone who worked to, you know, to build this place. So I think educating each other create and that's what creates the separation and anxiety to even connect with other black people is just like some people we're different and we are culturally but that culture thing is so you know narrow and it slides uh, it's it's kind of something that other people don't have to deal with it's another layer that we have to unpack and deal with that other cultures don't really have to do so i mean i'm sorry to take up the mic but you know that's that's how i feel and I think that plays a lot into the difficulty of being able to identify the symptoms of depression and anxiety, um, especially like, you know, Tanya was saying with all these cultures and, you know, regardless of, of all these backgrounds. And I like, you know, that you two are bringing up uh, the, that idea of strength and, you know, uh, black and colored people having to be uh, strong, you know, through all these difficulties and things. And that's what makes it even harder to identify because if we talk about something like depression, well, that's, that's, you know if we think of typical symptoms you know there's there's crying and isolating and uh, you know I, I can go on but it makes it harder because then we don't talk about those things you know like oh you know are you are you isolating for people are you feeling sad are you feeling down no i'm not i'm you know i'm okay i've got this i'm good that that makes it and it's, especially with anxiety as well it makes it even difficult more it makes it incredibly difficult to then identify those uh um those mental illnesses 
because you have a fixed response. Like right? you think that as soon as I told you I cried or I was this, now my everything else is up for you know up for analyzation and, and grabs and now i'm going to be Absolutely. dissected and diluted you know uh and by exposing that one that one vulnerability and and it's still you know i i think in general america has to start you know dealing with and unpacking but uh we see that white men can cry you know and get little boy emotions from the world, you know, so and and where those same little boys who cry are grown men and they're monsters, you know. So again, we still have to work on the mentality of how when we look at it, what do we interpret it as, you know? And that scares me to even be like that. But I know it's like part of my job to be vulnerable. Like, but it's sometimes in the space that I'm in and the environment that I work in, I have to be care. When I say be careful, like you know it's still an environment that that's a, for opportunities to take advantage of and they've learned how to you know look at certain things as vulnerabilities and, to, and as advantages so you have to learn a language and these are all things that have to be unpacked before someone trusts to tell you that they cried last night Absolutely. or that they you know cry in front of you or you know what i mean that they were weak right but you also have to understand when we're talking about anxiety and depression, culturally, we've been taught to stuff things down, not mm -hmm. to talk about them. What goes on in this house stays in this house. So if you're upset, you crying or whatever going on, you don't tell anybody outside of that. You you go tell your pastor or you tell tell mama and them and mama and them are going to tell you to suck it up and then we're going to move on. It's always that let, pray about let it. it go get or get over it, you mm -hmm. know, and we and we've systematically taught our children to be the same way. So when we look at anxiety and depression, um, especially I know within my family, when I see depression, it's physical. It's the sleeping all day. They're feeling like they're in a hole. They're not coming out. If if I'm if I if you're calling me or a family member and they're saying, oh, well, I'm just doing a little me time. Or well, me time is three days in the bed and they move or change clothes and shower. Mm -hmm. So when I'm thinking about depression, I'm thinking in those terms. Because when there's a shutdown, it's a complete shutdown. Now there needs to be a diagnosis of this is weighing um, six weeks or more at a time. Now that's when we're talking about the symptoms and recognizing it. Because we need to see that in our family. And the anxiety. Now anxiety is fear. There are all forms of fear. What do we, and, and as people of color, we deal with outside fear, police mm -hmm. brutality, all these different cultural things that we, oppression, financial, all these things on top of it. And then here come COVID. So we're, so we're dealing with these things mm -hmm. and we don't recognize them because we ignore them. We've been taught to ignore. We've been ta taught to ignore our feelings, our emotions, and not to express them. Because if you say anything, Justin, in so many ways, you were saying you're a punk if you talk about it. You're strong. Mm -hmm. You're not. You're weak. And we have to stop. That's what we have to get past because you're, right. you're weak if you express how you feel or you're weak if you're. And that's not the case at all strong people and, ask and it's pride and that comes from a, mm -hmm. a self-image of pride of just, but that's also you know, my grandfather did it, it my grain. father did it my brother like people right before me mm -hmm. and we're when we never get to see that that room my, my dad i never i i heard of my dad crying before that's you know that's real talk and 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 but there's a a narrative behind that that i understand and i see the perspective of his life his past i can take the whole picture but in general, if I left that statement alone, that's a very, you know, that's a very polarized statement in the sense of, I like I've never really experienced that with my dad, and he's a soldier, he's a vet, three time touring vet. Like there's so much behind, you know, the story. He's born in 1949. Like you can imagine now, I'm putting things in context of why I I will. He probably did that behind a closed door. He had to. Like there's no way that. You know what I mean? Like, and, but the idea that he couldn't or he shouldn't, only through perspective do you understand that why would somebody feel like they couldn't cry or would cry or shouldn't cry? And even how men show affection towards their sons, you know, and, and different things like that. I don't want my son to know, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, you know, that is this way because that would lead towards him being like that. 
you know what I mean? I want him to be me in all these ways, you know, and that is something that we have to pay attention to. Be careful. Are we generationally passing these these traits of avoidance, you know what I mean, on to, to the next generation or your household, your family, your loved ones? It's and it's telling, letting, allowing a safe place for people to do that, you know, because, you know, black people love to joke, love to laugh. <laughs> To, to get to to get on the other side and like i'm one of them i i can i can laugh at our pain but at the same time by myself and my wife knows that i am a tired like i am a tired like like we go ham in our house about you know conversations and what's going on and how we feel but at the same time we have to laugh like, you know it's the laugh to keep from crying aspect it's all this type of stuff we all experience sure sure so just kind of oh sorry go ahead behind, just really quickly i also think it's really difficult for us to recognize when we may be going through something such as depression because we view it differently so if we right. think how we have been conditioned to always be busy and always have something going on and when we are not we might feel lazy so in that case when that becomes a cycle you know, if we feel like we aren't doing something at the moment, then we are feeling lazy. And that feeling in itself causes symptoms such as depression, but we don't know how to recognize it as such. So we well, aren't even getting the help that we need. The workaholic right. depression amongst exactly. black men. Like not understanding, oh, he's a hustler. Like he's a, like, oh, he's at work. Like now nah, that man is avoiding his life. Exactly. Like, you so know real what quick, I mean? guys, I'm going to pause you off there just because we got a question that came in from, uh, one of our viewers, and they asked the question, how does equity and inclusion play a role in access to quality mental health treatment? That's an important question. This is, I think, a very prominent question that comes up a lot, which is just access to health care across the board. Um, so I, I want, I'm hoping you guys can speak to that a little bit. I, I don't know. It's weird for me. I felt I feel like Especially, and I'll, and I'll shift forward to the era that we're in of healthcare. Like, healthcare with the black community has always been available and free in there, but we have to work on our mental state and our health of how we view going to those places to get checked up. Your, your doctor is supposed to ask you some questions that would lead to them referring you to therapy. Have you been, you know, how have you been feeling? You've been down, you've been asleep. You're telling your doctor things to say, maybe you need to. It's certain things and taking advantage of health services and things like that. And I work in a school district, so I watch people refuse services that they clearly need, you know, they clearly need and they're denying through pride or they're trying to sustain a certain lifestyle or things that they, you know, not trying to heal, they're perpetuating. And so, there's different things that apply to that equity. I think, like, I think it's there, it's available, but when you don't want to show up to those things because you don't want to view or you don't want to get your, your child at IEP uh, uh, with, or, or learning support because you don't want people to think this about your, your child or do this or that and the third, and they're not now getting the care and support, now they're just right in the pipeline. They're, they're just a statistically not getting those services. And I watch people deny it due to, oh, my son's okay. My son's no, oh, he's just bad. He just needs to be, he just needs to get, you know, so that that thing of equity, like, is it there? I think it's there. We, we, we have to now view it as it's okay. And I think we're getting there amongst the community and saying that, but I, I think currently we just don't even know how to get in contact with the therapy and uh, know how to you know because i know that there are services available for them to speak to people and we have them around but what we suffer from in that community of service providers is that people don't show up you know and that because there are stigmas of what's going on right so that's my my particular what goes on in my little bubble but i mean i Anybody no, I agree with you, um, Justin. I think that a lot of it also comes down to just being uneducated about it. And I say that because I have people come to me and say, hey, you know, where can I find a therapist? I have insurance, but 
I don't have mental health insurance. So it's just like not knowing that their insurance is mental health insurance as well. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just around educating our people a little bit more about what they have access to and how to get to it. You know what? One thing I was thinking too, like they help seeking behaviors because that's what we're talking about. Because it's affected also by mistrust of the middle of the medical system in the first place. So we, I mean, we have to really just go there. Um, and then also faith based. If we don't have, you know, faith based wise, if a pastor is not saying, or a church member is not saying, you might want to go get professional help. It's not always happening that way. So we also, and like I said, mistrust alone as a community is keeping it keeping it from that inclusion or going for it. Because at the end of the day, I know men, especially men in my household, if, if if I got to make my husband go, because it's like, if unless he dying, he's not walking to go. And that's most men I know who, if, if they're not, if, if it got to take something traumatic for <laughs> Steph, I was laughing. You got to take something traumatic for them to go because of the mistrust. So I can, I'm all right. I'm going to be all right. I take a, a Robitussin or I take a, a Tylenol PM and I'm fine. And that's not necessarily the case when it's high blood pressure, mental health or anything else is going on. We wait till the worst of the worst and we end up in a hospital bed before we we take care of it and that's what we have to that mistrust has been a big barrier for us you know great so great step i saw you nod your head there a bit what were you thinking yeah i, I completely agree um i like this question because it's 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 kind of difficult but i completely agree with uh with tanya with tanya and with tanya saying like um there's the mistrust for sure and then like justin said there's there it's there the access is there but it's complicated you know there's there's mistrust of um i mean just there's mistrust of medical professionals and then also mistrust of you know how do i go to this person where i need to spill my guts and talk about all this private stuff you know and and, and trust this person especially if they don't look like me and i'm sure we'll go into more of that and um and i think that fuels you know some of the stigma with the black community going to talk to a mental health professional but i, I yeah I, I don't know this question is very interesting it's just very loaded and there's just there's a lot to it so that's I'm sure, agreeing with sure. what everyone's saying yeah absolutely and, and listen the thing I want to bring up here because we're going to move in a different direction but sort of stay in the same place which is based on what I heard everyone say and what I heard questions from home is is that this idea of equal access isn't so equal and the reality of it is is that it's almost this feeling maybe, I think that people, what I'm hearing is it's separate but equal, but it's not. And, and that makes seeking out uh, mental health care, quality treatment, difficult. And I think that often causes that stigma associated with seeking out mental health care. Because I know maybe I'm not going to get the quality care that I deserve. So my question for you guys right now is, you know, what are your perceptions on how stigma impacts uh, an individual uh, who want to seek out health care? We want to seek out mental health care. Tough question. <laughs> but straight up, because if yep. you don't look like me, how can you help me? Sure. If you don't look well, like uh, me, here, here, how can you help me? Here's a <laughs> you don't know here's nothing about my background. You haven't I, been through what I've been through. How can you help me? You can't. Uh, can I ask you anybody and that's else what they say. Mm-hmm. And I heard this from my grandmother before. So, so this is something that I, I kind of unloaded later. But my grandma will only want a white doctor mm. because wasn't sure if they were giving the black doctor the same level of education mm. to be oh, able wow. to deal wow. with him the same. And I and like later on, I'm now unpacking that. I'm like, that is a level or a layer of it that, of course, when I say not right, is meaning like if she's being honest and the, and then when I looked at the profession in the world of like, okay, when do we have the opportunity to see the black doctor? It's just that maybe that's why the education part of it is not processing them through. And maybe, and you know, it started opening up that mindset of like, okay, why will, would miseducation be a part of the healthcare system and the lack of care or lack of knowledge of uh, and grouping and things like that, you know, and I'll be honest, you know, my wife is pregnant right now, we're expecting, and we're not satisfied with how the healthcare system is 10 years be- between our last child. We're not satisfied with how they're they're treating us and we're, we're worried about 
things that I feel like you're not worried about or you should be, you should be caring about. And they're, they're like, oh, well, statistically, this is this, this. Well, the statistics that we know and that I'm looking at, it, it's like there's a way bigger margin of error here. So do you do you research this? Do you understand this? Now we're educating, you know, <laughs> culturally, yeah. like to look in these places. So that shift of what we see and what we think is right, you know what I mean? Or who's the doctor and who has the more information? So right. if you like what I agree with Tanya, if like I need to know that you had at least experienced this somehow in your life, meaning seeing this, have dealt with this because most black doctors come from a generation of someone who was sick and they want to learn how to, you know, prevent that or work on that. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we need to not have people dying or getting sick to have more black doctors. Got it. And those Got black it. doctors need to so, be towards it. that, you know, that, that community. But and, think about and, something though. You're talking about medical, right? And we're talking right. about mental health. So can you well, imagine? Well, and, and again, like, these, are the, the again, these are the communities, and I and I get these are mm -hmm. the communities that I feel like that support because those are the people we go to first. They should right. be telling you this is not a you know this or I'm seeing drug use and we're seeing what's going here now. Mm -hmm. They should be referring because they recognize it, they see it, right. they know when they when it comes in. This is okay. I understand what that is. Sure. I understand why, you know, why you feel this way or what's going on. My mother, my sister, my brother, you know, and the, so maybe you should talk to this person. Sure. Maybe you do this. Asking questions because the questions that we get from our white doctor are very checklist. You this, you this. Have you feel, Have you been feeling down at all? Like, and my wife, yes. Okay. Like, okay. Or uh, do you do this? I'm like, okay. So like how do we you know and we talk about it, we talk about it and we get to unload it and what goes on but we're now missing the, the component where they're not even addressing the mental health questions mm -hmm. on the questionnaire properly right. in my opinion so there's a part of the medical part where we go to those places we seek in those places to get help and those places should be sending us properly and getting us the proper care all the way around just to right. really Absolutely. refer you to a chiropractor you know Sure. Should to a therapy. Uh, I agree, Justin. Here. Sorry, I keep cutting you off, Ryan. No, okay. I, jump in. I'm sorry. I was I just going talking. to add that I also think that it's important for them to recognize that mental health symptoms can sometimes appear physical. So when they are doing these tests in the doctor's office and they're ruling out everything, uh, you know, that a medical doctor would. At that point, they should be referring to mental health providers because something that they're missing, they say, oh, nothing is wrong with you. However, a lot of these symptoms are appearing as physical symptoms, but they are actually mental issues that are going on that are manifesting as physical mm -hmm. symptoms. Great point. And Justin, you said the biggest thing about your wife, she says she's not doing well. First thing I would think as a clinician is that, OK, postpartum depression is probably setting in because she's pregnant. You know, and among African American women, it's high. So now we gotta do some because once the baby comes, does that settle in too? So these are our questions, especially when pregnancy and all those things, mental health is affected in so many different ways, you know. So that's something I would, you know, have to go to a second opinion. Cause now I'm like, I need my my wife to be okay, especially given being care caretaking my child. Cause if the child's not sleeping, that affects her even more. So there's so many different caveats going on in that process. So this is why it's so important because it does affect our children if we're not healthy, you know? Right. So I just right. Want to and since we're right. talking about the stigma in the black community, I mean, I'm thinking now, you know, if we're talking, referring, you know, people from, you know, the medical side to the mental health, how willing are these individuals, how willing are they actually going to, you know, take that referral to go see a therapist, a counselor, a social worker? You know, because of that stigma, like, oh, well, you know, my, my medical doctor is telling me, yeah, OK, this could be depression. Here's a referral for a psychiatrist, psychologist, counselor, therapist. And like, ah, uh, no, you know what? I, I'm OK. You know, I can I can I can handle this. Right. Right. And Stefan, what I hear there is kind of a, uh, a lack of cultural competence, right, and cultural awareness about who the person is sitting in front of them. What I heard was and one of the, one of the viewers here is. I keep seeing it pop up. It sounds like there's a lot of barriers 
to getting quality treatment, getting connected with professionals who individuals can connect with. So I guess my question for for everyone here is, is how do people overcome those barriers? What, you know, I've seen it before where individuals have to jump through hoops to get services. And so I guess my question is for, for, for everyone on the panel is, is how do people get beyond those barriers? What steps do they need to take? What can you tell them? What advice can you give them? The, uh, I, I don't have an individual, like, you know, their, the, the bureaucracy is just always going to be ridiculous. And I've worked inside of a school district where I thought things should be expedited. And they go through the same process of, well, it has to, we have to wait till this IEP meeting. Okay, well, when's the meeting? Uh, two weeks from today. Uh, well, this kid has two full weeks to, you know, to go through without any care being initiated. You know, like that part of it is almost seems like it's baked into the system. You know what I mean? Like that, especially when black children are getting health care services through, uh, through the state or the district. That bureaucratic process is always just something, you know, I'm on a soapbox about that just needs to be dealt with. But what I feel like happens, and we talked about faith-based things and, and stuff, that these places, first of all, need to adopt and understand mental health better. They need to educate themselves better, but use their space and their resources to allow uh, doctors or people to use their space where they're comfortable. Come into their, their space and treat them clinically using outside space because that's why we we have a classroom without walls wherever you go wherever you're at we'll come to you we'll bring everything to you and we'll teach that lesson where you're at you know and we'll carry it to you and that kind of meeting people at the door type thing find out where they're at you know where they're where they're meeting you hold the schools more accountable you know like the city council it's an initiative that has to come with we're going to deal with this particular issue it's never going to be it's always going to be you're going to have to be patient. It's always going to be you got to wait. You got to wait. You got to wait until we're active, reacting instead of proactive about it. So I think an initiative from our communities needs to start our healthcare professionals, even our community people like Tanya, holding those places accountable. Say, how are you using this place? How are you using your tax free exemption? How are you using this to, to help this community? and show we need to see results from that. And when there's somebody like that in the community, those resources get get used pro a little bit better or properly, and it kind of speeds things up because now they use that government funding to create a, a therapy program. I've seen churches try, you know, try to create access, but that's what you do. You force them to use those resources. I, 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 want, I want to, for me, I, I live in South Florida, so where, we're pretty blessed when it comes to resources. Um, we have, and it, it's probably everywhere, but NAMI for, it's the National Association of Mental Health, uh, Mental Health Illness. It, they have websites, they have resources, they have groups. So we have so many different um, avenues, um, which would go on towards mental health. And sometimes people don't, are not aware of it. So we as clinicians, though, us in the field, we have to talk more about those resources. And we also have to educate ourselves, especially with the nonprofit. nonprofit. We have a few mm -hmm. of those, like the Lord's Place. Um, uh, some of the churches I know down here, uh, especially um, Boynton Beach, we had a few uh, where we're starting to realize that um, suicide among African American and Black men are higher, where the, the conversation is coming up with that because we have a lot of veterans even with um partnering with the veterans hospital and things like that because of uh ptsd you know a lot of people don't know it's five forms of ptsd it's not just one type you know and um we talked about just educating the population but with health fairs and things like that but it has to be a community like you were saying, Justin, all the way around. But from one state to another state, everybody does something different. And it takes those people who pioneer and say, listen, we got to, like you said, hold people accountable. And then also us as clinicians and people of color, we need to be in that conversation as well. We, we definitely need to be in a conversation to make sure that the people that we care for are getting what they need at the end of the day. But we have to access those and we have to access those so in order for us to tell people who are not aware. So we have a responsibility too. 
you know, and I think sometimes a lot of us forget that because we're just focusing on the patients that we take care of. But in taking that becoming when I became a clinician, it was about taking care of, of my people, meaning all those in recovery who look like me, walk like me, but also those who don't but also have the experience of trauma and things like that. So for me, it's, it's got to be everybody. But I also know within the Black community, there's a population where the education has to be, where the fear and mistrust has to be lifted. And that's why yeah. we're here now having this conversation. I love it. Thank you. That was great, Tanya. Thank you. And so you bring us to another question here, which I think is, is you know, all this is kind of tying together, right? Which is, we, we've, we've heard of today about some of the stigma We've heard about barriers, um, and, and I think it's important to talk about, obviously, the other side of this, too. So what are the misconceptions you think that, that, that individuals have when it comes to seeking therapy, right? Like, what are the things that they maybe think it's this when it's actually this? And what's the, what things do you think they need to hear to begin to kind of reduce these misconceptions about seeking out therapy? Um, for at least from from where I'm sitting, and a lot of the people I see, it, um, and this goes back to something that Justin touched on. I like the way he said it about, um, and I'll speak from you know the uh, African American, black, colored man, uh, male perspective. Like talking about you know your feelings makes you weak. And that's kind of like a big misconception with therapy. Of, okay, if I have to go see a therapist, I've got to you know I've got to swallow my guts and. Uh, yeah. Cry, you yeah, cry. cry on a couch, and that's gonna that's gonna come off as weak. But yeah, I think that's that's a big one. At least what I'm, you know, and what I've seen from my experience. Great, thanks, Stefan. Any other I, uh, thoughts here? I, as you know, growing up, uh, I, I had an uncle who, who who suffered from at the time. Like I said, no one wanted to, to uh, identify. But I know a, a couple of people in the family had suggested that he go seek help. And he would say out of his mouth, and this is an older African-American man, uh, I'm not crazy. I'm not going to talk to nobody about my problems. And I was like, wait a minute. What do you, <laughs> it's not about that. It's about you get some things off your chest because it's causing you to react a certain way. But we have a lot of old stereotypes about what the couch is. Like Sigmund and Floyd with the, you know, with the cigar, or the um, pipe in his mouth. And it's, it's um it's all Speaking looking at approach. the little link yeah, dots right. and things like that so it's just it, we have to get past that old way of thinking it's just a way of saying listen i just need somebody to hear me you know get some things off my chest to process some things i've been going through because i'm struggling and we have to make it look more like a conversation and not like a full therapy session because some people are just not open to that that concept so we have to be I more i guess um more is friendly about how we present it not so formal is what i'm trying to say not so yeah formal. i would say to, to parents like to younger you know people i would say that uh the stigma of you know my kids going to be put in slow classes or you know my kids going to be put back behind if i allow them to see a therapist in school it's going to now create a stigma for my child and make their life even harder in that place when actually getting those services are the best thing you can do, especially if your your child is dealing with emotional or behavioral, you know, things, because now everyone can identify like is is first of all their job to identify it. So now they now but now they have a whole support team of people documenting and thinking about daily how they can support your child or your student. So if you're having issues or trouble at home, your schools are great places to get free, especially if you go to a public school. But your school is a, is a great place to get uh, health service, mental health services, and they have to give them to you, and they're free. You know, and, and so again, it's it's one of those things that don't forget about your resources, your community resources that are right there, and and that it's not hurting your child, but it's actually helping them. And then uh, those services lead into their adult life. And they're they're able to keep and continue to get that support. Fantastic. All right, let's do this. Uh, you know, you guys again bring up all these great uh, ideas, feedback, thoughts, and so another topic and an area to go into is talking about racial trauma, right? And so I think the question uh, is, how do you handle racial trauma 
with whether it be with your clients, students, or yourself? Well, I'm from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I don't know if anybody's ever been in Pennsylvania or the area, but uh, we're a capital city. But here's the crazy thing about my city: we're only uh, less than fifty thousand people but 95% black within city limits. Mm -hmm. So we're probably the best example of us is like Washington, DC, where every all the legislation and politics happen right there for the state, but everything else goes back out and you're left with the wire, you know? So it's, it's one of those things that we experience things in a, you know, kind of in this type of bottle. So, racial child comes from kind of on a, when i say global scale kind of we're looking at the the capital you know big ivory building at the end of the thing we that's our you know our adversary when we, we look around at what's going on so right. when systemic things are going on and and, and we're, we're making shifts you know we have a black female mayor who's my aunt you know hello hey auntie you know who just made it and congratulations you know, it, so it's one of those things that we make, we're making shifts of power and that access, you know, to create the access to the power and resources. But you get a real close look at how government access play, makes a, you know, takes a play. So it's not always, I don't always see the trauma from a racial standpoint there. We're seeing the trauma, what happens when you don't give the resources and you take away things from a black community you know does that make sense we're, we're conflicted by the same things that all other communities are so we're seeing the trauma through systemic you know systemic things like school this bad school district and you know limited resources great thank you justin other views um when they, when you talk about trauma especially within the um the black and african-american community just racial trauma for one and then also childhood trauma sexual trauma um all those things come we compound together um and then we're talking about we just had like we talked about the shootings of uh, several different people lost their lives sen senselessly we're almost numb to it i hate to mm -hmm. say that but we're really and that's trauma within itself that we're so numb to it because yeah. we're used to, to those things you know and i'm one of those people i believe in having an honest conversation because even though we'll, we'll protest, we'll fight, and we'll do all these things in front of people to show strength, but behind the scenes, we're unraveling. And we don't talk about the unraveling part, that why somebody look like me, walk like me, talk like me, is gunned down like a dog on a daily basis for just, mm -hmm. you know, driving down the street. Every every Black man that shows up in the morning to go to work, I got to worry about him walking out the door and him not coming back. You know, these this is on these these are on perpetual traumas that we deal with because it's a sense of always in that sense of anxiety. So for us, it's like we have to have a true conversation. And say, you know what? We're living with constant trauma, repetitive trauma from the same things, which is not being healed. And the thing is, once we start work talking about it and picking apart and healing it, something else happens. So now we're re-traumatized. So we're back where we started. So it's almost like why nothing changes, nothing changes. So why deal with it? Press it down, go through the motions one day at a time. But it's not helping us as a people at the end of the day. So we have to be willing to have the conversation and say, you know what? I'm not doing well. And I need to figure out who I need to talk to, who understands in that trauma that they understand it too. And they've been healing them, going through a healing process themselves, a transformational process. Because if, if somebody's got the same thing and they haven't worked on it, what can they tell me? They're dealing with it the same way I'm dealing with it. So that's the conversation we have to, how do we deal with it honestly and have the conversation until we do that? Well, we're, we're back where we started. Absolutely. And, and as you guys say all these things, you know, I've, I've been spending more time listening to conversations about racial trauma. And I think for therapists, especially, they need to have a better understanding that racial trauma is not just something that's presently going on. It's literally generations of trauma that have now become literally, it sounds like ingrained in the minds um, of many people of color. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to hear these conversations going on. We, again, segue into another direction here as we kind of are close to finishing up. 
Um, but, you know, I think it's important to have this conversation and, and for the viewers to hear this, which is, number one, what can you do if you know that someone um, has been struggling um, with their own mental health and are scared to ask for help? And if that is the case, what are the available resources that, that are out there for them? I want to say one thing when it comes to that, because we, we, we as clinicians can recognize it, but I'm talking about within families and friends and stuff like that. Ask them, how you doing? Simple as that. And you'd be surprised just asking them that because we don't always ask each other that, how you doing? And it was funny how they did these mental health commercials just recently with that very I question. Love, I, I didn't get a chance. You know? I love how they're Yeah, adjusting. it's just, right. how are you doing? And it's as soon as you pose that question, especially to somebody you care about, they see, okay, somebody is watching me, care about me, and, and, and really want to know how I'm doing. Especially if you, you have a friendship with that person. Because asking that question can now set up a full conversation and then okay we can go to the resource from that point on but just asking that simple question how are you doing really you know so that's my feedback. or if you do have a relationship with that person um you are likely to recognize their behavior so if you want to go a little bit deeper from the how are you doing question because in our community most people say oh i'm good i'm fine you know mm -hmm. they they give that generic i'm good i'm fine they aren't really opening up Say, hey, you know, I noticed that I haven't talked to you. You've been a little withdrawn in the last few days. I wanted to check in and see how are you really doing? You know, you want to put a little bit to the question mm -hmm. to really be able to open it up a little bit more and allow them to have that conversation. So I think it's a little bit more important than just asking the how are you doing, but adding that extra piece to it so that they know that they have the opportunity to kind of tell you, because I think what it comes down to is a lot of people don't want to put the burden of their problems on anyone else. So they aren't being honest about how they're really feeling. Or they feel like there's nothing you can do for me. So sure. I might as well hold on to it. Right. And a lot of things what she was saying, I, I see that with our community too, like we have our greetings, but then there's a the question or there's the thing behind the greeting. So what's up? I'm going to say what's up, no matter what. My dad's always responds, nothing's up. That's his response. Like, and I'm not asking you, is something up, dad? I'm saying what's up, what's up? But he, literally, it needs to go to the the figurative, the literal part of now. Nah, but how's everything with you know? And did and and move past that greeting and that hey, what's up, bro? What's good with you? That Pam, everything's good. You know, we have a a, a general exchange that we'll have. But then not not really like you would well how's the family how i know that this you were going through that last time did it like how did that work out you know mm -hmm. what i mean like in engaging past that greeting is really what shows other people because especially i keep talking about my kids but my students but that's one of my main i go to work dressed like this as a teacher like and i do it because it's one less thing visually you have to identify but my question what's going on man how you doing like good and I say it in the quietly in their ear, like, hey, swim on, right? Good. Sincerely, like, that's not a generic greeting. Mm -hmm. You know, there's ways that we have to change things to show our sincerity and what's going on. And that can help people feel more comfortable to agree. And not, oh, I thought you were just saying hi. No. Like, what are you, like, no, what's going on with you? How are mm -hmm. you doing? Absolutely. And I think, you know, everything what you guys are saying, you know, and, and kind of, again, tying it all together, you know, I think what we've learned today is that there is this stigma um, associated with, with especially with people of color and the reality of it is is that it's it's everyone's mission to try to kind of break that stigma and encourage individuals to seek help encourage them to ask for support when they need it encourage individuals to educate themselves on what the resources are because they're out there right and there's resources now we've had this pandemic and it has caused humans across the board, but especially people from, I'd say, from urban populations to have to connect on a whole different level, where now we have access to things we didn't have access to before. There are, there are social media platforms, there are Zoom meetings, there are therapists, there are groups, there are, is everything across the board. And so if, if people don't work universally to try to break this stigma and support each other, then it's just going to be kind of this unfortunate revolving door um and so everyone tonight i think brought up amazing amazing information and just great ideas for for individuals to when they leave here hopefully to keep thinking about it 
and pay it forward to the next person. Um, at this point, again, I want to just first point out again that uh, along the bottom of the screen there, there is a number, there's a helpline. If you or someone else is struggling with your own mental health related issues or someone else's, please reach out to the number located there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, there is a website. There's also a phone number. Please reach out for help. Um, I want to thank all the individuals tonight who joined us on the panel. Again, we have Tanya, Justin, Stefan, and Kashara. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Again, uh, everyone have a wonderful night, and uh, please stay safe out there.